Warren Demartini here on the orange couch at the Music Zoo in Long Island, New York. You know, a lot of my friends have been doing this for years, so I'm going to just jump right off the end of the the end of the cliff and just go for it, having absolutely no plan. So that's what the theme of this this is going to be: no plan. <laughs> <laughs> When I started playing, uh, I had just a, just a guitar, no amp, nothing like that, and I had the old turntable, you know, the, with the 78, 33, and 16 speed. We'll come back to that, the 16 speed. But um, it had a headphone jack, you know, and I noticed that the headphone jack uh, was kind of similar to a guitar jack. So I was like, I know that the signal goes this way, but what would happen if I plugged the guitar into the headphone jack and put it on auxiliary? And sure enough, you know, I kind of got a sound out of it, you know, so now I, now I, I had some amplification. So again, no plan, just trying stuff as, as, you, as you're going along. Well, guy moves on from a band and uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, local, local band, high school band, they're like, uh, you know, we need a guitar player, you want to do something? I'm like, I'm not, I'm not ready to be in a band or anything like that. And they're like, yeah, you are, you know? And I go, yeah, but I don't, I don't know these songs. And they go, well, you can work on the songs, you know? So I said, well, I don't have an amp. And they said, well, you, well, you can just bring your stereo with you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was the beginning. I remember... Uh, way back before that, when I was a little, little kid, and uh, my old brothers had guitars around and all that kind of stuff, and uh, someone was kind of trying to show me how to get it at all, you know, and it's like, well, let's start with how to tune it, you know, this is how you tune it, you know, this string is the same as this string, and this string is the same as this string, and this string is the same as this string. Uh, this one, you go down a half step, and I remember going, <laughs> Why? Why does it go down a half step there? You know? And he goes, I don't know. It just does. And then you go back up to here for this string. And I was like, Oh my God! I'm never. I just like I'm never going to get my head around why that drops down on that one side. But but uh, it really doesn't matter. It's not like a piano where it changes. You just go up the same, and everything stays the same. You know. Thank you. So a few years after that, that story about the headphone jack, um, I'm, I'm like, uh, well, first of all, my, my first big love was uh, surfing. You know, my family moved from Chicago to San Diego when I was about uh, 12 years old, and, and uh, I got into, into all the stuff that you can do at the beach. So I, so I really wanted to be, you know, I wanted to do that. I wanted to surf. and. Uh, so as I got into high school, you could kind of choose your own classes and all this kind of stuff. And uh, so I, would sh I made P.E. after lunch because on Friday there was an hour lunch. So I could, you, you know, you had enough time to get down to the beach, surf for a little while, and there was a 15-minute suit-up period. So I actually had an hour and 20 minutes about get down there, surf, get back, school drenched, and get to class, right? Well... That worked most of the time, but, but you could only be late like five times a semester. And, and I, uh, I was late more than that because of these hour lunches and I would try to surf and get back. So it's like, you know, the report card comes on me and my mom's like, uh, you failed PE? 
<laughs> yeah. They have, by the way, they have, uh, you, can, you can pick surfing for uh, your PE now from the, at that school. But back then you couldn't, and, uh, and I, feel, I failed PE uh, that whole year and like I think the next semester after that. So I was way behind on credits when it came time to graduate high school. So um, I was, uh, you know, they let me go through the ceremony, but in my little, my little diploma thing it says, you know, you need three credits. So I was uh, enrolled in the JC about two miles away. So, you know, I did my thing the rest of that summer. I had a, I had a band called Enforcer, and uh, it was uh, the, one of the, the guy playing bass used to play ba uh, in a band with Jakey e. Lee. You, you know who Jakey e. Lee is, of course. So Jake uh, had that whole 12th grade year had uh, moved from, he moved right when I was going into 12th grade, he moved to San Diego, or from San Diego to LA to join RAT. And uh, he got, and then, you know, uh, his bass player didn't have a band, so he joined up with me and we were playing. And uh, Jake got my band enforcer to open for Rat in Burbank. This was a big, big deal, right? Because for one thing, in San Diego, they didn't really like original music that much, or at least the people that were like, you know, booking places, you know, it just wasn't, it was, it was more of a top 40 thing. And uh, LA wasn't like that, it was just the opposite. They, they wanted original stuff. So we had some original songs and uh, we had one really kind of uh, killer little, little thing. My, the drummer of that band had recorded Ozzy live on the radio and there happened to be a song in that set. He recorded it on his cassette tape. There happened to be a song from that broadcast that was on a record that was out in the UK, but it wasn't out in America. So this was right after, this was the Diary of a Madman album. So of course everyone was really familiar with Blizzard, you know, Blizzard of Oz, but everyone, no one knew what Diary of Madman sounded like it because it wasn't going to come out for another couple of months in the States. So my band had, so I was like, we should learn this song, you know, and it's like uh, we're going to be playing an unreleased Aussie song. Well, turns out we played that song in Randy Rhodes' hometown of Burbank, you know. <laughs> <laughs> People went really, I mean, it really went well, played it well, sounded great. And, uh, you know, standing ovation, and it was amazing. And I'm pretty sure that was sort of the moment that it was like, damn, you know. And I think that's what ended up getting me in rap. Because a couple of months after that, Jake Ely moved on, and, um, and Stephen called me. He's like, hey, man, you want to you wanna join rap? And I was like, and, you know, this is the, I'm rolled in the JC. We need to get those credits to get my diploma, man. Yeah. And I was like, um, yeah, you know, let me, uh, let me get, you know, let me do a semester at this, you know, at Mesa. He knew who Mesa was because Steven was from San Diego, too. And, uh, you know, and the, you know maybe, maybe then, you know, yeah, give me like six months. He's like, six months, man, you got to come up tonight. You got a gig at the Troubadour, you know, this is on a Sunday, you know. You got a gig at the Troubadour in five days and, you know, you got to come up. And I was just like, let me call you back. So um, I was like, uh, called him back, said, all right, all right, I'm in. So, but where am I going to stay? And he goes, well, it's, Jake said you could stay on his couch for a couple of weeks until you figure out what you're going to do. That's part of the deal, and he's going to show you the set. I was like, all right, all right, uh, you know, what the hell. Again, no plan. <laughs> no plan. Uh, so I was like, uh, yeah, you know, this is going to be a, a pretty big thing to to announce to my mom. It'd be, be way better to do this from up there, you know. So I, I I'm like packing, you know. I have all of my stuff on the second floor, you know. I get like two cabinets into my car, a couple of, a couple of Marshall heads, or you know, one Marshall head, to, you know, guitar, all you know, whatever. I just got everything in there. Now it's getting dark, and uh, I'm like, I'm almost, you know, I'm just almost out of here, you know, and. Uh, here come these headlights down the, 
down the, uh, you know, down the street, and I'm like, oh, God. And sure enough, it was my mom. She's like, where are you going? I'm moving to L.A., Mom. I'm going to join a rock band. <laughs> Oh, I wouldn't do that. I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> so one of the songs uh, I learned that week was Back for More. Thank you. But, uh, we, we ended up playing a lot of gigs just to, to almost nobody for, for a long time. Um, but, but things started to get better and better, and then there was uh, a band canceled uh, opening for Saxon at the Whiskey and two shows, and that, that changed everything, man. It was sold out house of, you know, people really into... Uh, metal and although I, like, I'm not sure rat really fair to call rat a metal band we you know it was it it worked and and uh after that the shows got better and better and then i didn't know it but a friend of mine I mean, we ended up being friends but this guy glenn started hanging around and uh he he uh i had a, a bootleg charvel that i built you know out of you you know out of uh buy a neck from, from someone that worked there, you know, second, real cheap in a body. And he's like, so you like Charvels, huh? And I was like, yeah. And uh, he's like, oh, that's cool. He goes, if you could have, uh, you know, an, uh, well, you know, your design one, what would you do? And I was like, uh, well, I don't know. Like, uh, at the time, I was really into the whole pirate thing. I was like, you know, it'd be kind of cool to have some skulls and, you know, send some blood. And, uh, and then one day after a show at the Troubadour, uh, he, uh, Glenn Matazel shows up with this, and he's just like, here, man, I love your playing, you know, you love, your, love the band here, and he listens for you. I was like, who are you, man? Yeah, yeah no, that was the beginning of a, of a, of a cool collaboration. And, and, uh, on this one, by, the, by this one, I knew who he was and what he did, and, and I was like, you know, I, I, I like Japanese characters, and I like the clip art that's on the, uh, the, the bomber jacket that Gary Moore's wearing on the Corridors of Power album. And, um, and, that's, that, and that's what this is derived from, you know, the whole thing in this, uh, like the, the patch that has this clip art on it has Japanese writing like this all the way around it. And um, he just happened to pick the one that said London. I mean, I never thought anyone was going to see these things, you know. Um, so it was, it was it's, it really could have said anything, and it was actually kind of a reckless thing to put something like this on there without knowing, because we did do well in Japan, and I did, you know, was asking, and it was, why, why does it say London on your guitar, you know? And at that moment, I was like, oh, man, I could have said anything. You know? <laughs> So on this one, I recorded the whole Out of the Cellar record with that. And um, some of the solos were like... Uh... <laughs> Thank you. 
plan. No plan. Hey, first of all, I want to say thanks, thanks for coming out to everybody. Let's hear for Warren for coming here and doing this. Yeah. The tunes that you played thus far, you didn't play round and round, right? Uh, I don't think we, we did that one. No. no. That was, that was... That's a song that a lot of people really dig. <laughs> but you know what, Warren, let me ask you. So, um, since you joined the band, you know, and it, and it already existed uh, with Jake um, at the time of that first record, um, were all these songs written already when you went in to record them, or no? You you had a part in that as well. In um, on out of the cellar. Yeah. Yeah. They were. They were. Uh, they were pretty pretty much pretty much written. I wrote three, I wrote the music to three of those and uh, collaborated on one. Wanted Man I collaborated on and uh, right. You're in Trouble and uh, Morning After and Round and Round I wrote all the music for except for uh, the part that Robin uh, blended together and uh, Round and Round I had the uh Robin was like, uh, oh, I got another song that I'm working on that would be great for that part. And he goes, go to... And I'm like, man, that's way too country sounding. <laughs> to it tomorrow I'll just leave it and leave it alone I never I never mentioned it again <laughs> we were um, originally that song was supposed to have uh, kind of like Wanted Man you know a Warren section and a Robin section and on that one he didn't like what he was doing on um, the uh, what ended up being the double lead, and I was like, "Well, maybe, maybe instead of he goes, you, well, you just do the whole thing." And I was like, "No, man, let's uh, let's just do something. Let's just do a double thing there, you know." So that's when I wrote the. Now, if I can just remember, it. there's two, of course. So. out his part and, and uh, ended up being a very great bit of collaboration there you know so how long did you get to spend in the studio you were saying before that you know in the earliest days of when you were in rat it wasn't you know uh, overflowing fountains of money and and uh, limousines and uh, <laughs> all of those other things you, you just were given, like, here's your slot in the studio, get to work. So how much time did you have, uh, you know, to, to make that record? On, well, on that, on that record, it, 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 it was very worked out to be, you know, the, you, you know uh, so many days for basics, you know, bass and drums. Right. And then uh, so many days to, to, you know, do guitars. And everything was, was very uh, worked out. So I think we did that whole thing in 21 days. Wow. Not not including the mixing. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. So what? So did you go out uh, right away and tour as an opener for for someone, or what? What happened in those yeah, earliest, yeah. like leading up to the record coming we out? We were doing better and better in L.A., so we were doing our our, our pretty much our own stuff, and and uh, we could do our own thing in L.A. because the way we got signed was uh, this this. Uh, 
this really awesome DJ named uh, Joe Benson created a show called Local Licks, which was um, drive, you know, on Friday at five when it was just traffic nightmare. Um, he would play uh, three on or two, two on, you know, 15 minutes of unsigned bands. So we had the EP and uh, he started playing You Think You're Tough off the EP. Wow. And that, that was a game changer. Um, That's so like unheard of. <laughs> it was just unheard of to be on. On, uh, Here's bands on, that the, aren't on the radio, on a label. Yeah, yeah. Um, or you know, I remember I had this little. Uh, I don't know if you remember, in the, like in uh, eighty two, eighty three, there was this little uh, ghetto blaster that, that they were sort of primary colors, like yellow, uh, blue, whatever. You know, it, uh, I had one of those that had a cassette player and the radio and all that kind of stuff, and I was always listening to everything through that, like right. in our work mixes. You know, I press play, you know, and I hear the... And then, and then uh, it was the strangest feeling. It was almost like, uh, you know, when a plane takes off and there's that moment when the wheels, you know, aren't touching the ground anymore and you, you're, you're, it's just different. Like, I remember uh, when they played You Think You're Tough, I was listening to it the same thing I was listening to our stuff, only this time I didn't start it, <laughs> you know? It, it, it was just like, oh, you know, just like this, this strange magic thing, you know, kind of energy was coming out of it now. And uh, th that, was, uh, that, was, that was a memorable moment. I remember Robin, you know, going, oh, turn on the radio, turn on the radio, we're on the radio. It was killer. So, uh, so how did the deal come through and what were you guys doing? You know, you, you're still playing clubs. I guess I'm wondering, you know, like, Still, that liftoff period, you know, right before the record came out, and if you started to open for bigger bands, and you know, yeah, like uh, how the crew um, took off, you know, you know, uh, at first we were just, just, just uh, playing with everybody we could. Uh, it was Easy Top, Sat Black Sabbath. Um, did a pretty long tour with Billy Squire, mm -hmm. um, and then. Um, and then, as 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 the as the as the uh, the video was was played more and more, we could do then start doing our own stuff. So we did we did a full, almost a, you know the whole country with Billy Squire, and then we did did it all again on our own. Wow! By then, yeah. So, but that fir that first year was just uh, you know just opening for whoever you could, you know right. anything anything. Right. And I would imagine you were seeing, you know, a greater reaction. You know, as the shows were progressing and more people were aware of the band, aware of you, and you know, press, more press. You know, like they probably started to pick up. The Sabbath gig didn't go so good. Really? No, I didn't. Uh, I remember that one was was like uh, it just wasn't our crowd. <laughs> it just wasn't. Um, but but uh, it was it was doing it was doing better and better, and you could you could really tell the t the towns that that MTV already had MTV right that that really was just uh, a a massive cultural change that i remember when MTV uh came to San Diego and and, and uh seeing Carlos on there you remember Carlos was on the commercial like on MTV and you know he was like i didn't realize it was bang, <laughs> bang your head uh, cuz they, they 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 had that song out a couple of years before you know, before we released uh, Out of the Cellar. And uh, I remember seeing, you know, getting ready for school and watching Carlos on MTV. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so how much later did you go in to do Invasion of Your Privacy? And, you know, by that point, I assume a lot had happened uh, just in terms of, you know, where Rat was at. You know, the record, the first record did well, and you had some serious play it was pretty quick um it was pretty quick we we got a little break i remember the last bit of touring we did was in japan and then uh we uh uh stopped in hawaii for for uh a few weeks and i remember juan brought his uh you know a little cassette four track thing and we uh recorded a few things that would go on to be on that record. You know, one was uh, Lay It Down. 
Don't stop. What are you stopping for? Thank you. So Warren, I have to ask you, you know, when you were younger, you know, who were the guitar players that really influenced your playing, you know, for rhythm playing, for soloing, for, you know, you have such a distinct, is a very aggressive style with a big vibrato and, you know, so uh, really good vibrato, right? <laughs> So, you know, what were you listening to and lifting the needle on or listen, you know, like who were the guys that you were like, man, I want to, you know, I'd like to grab some of that. Ah, you know, the, I, I think the very beginning of it was uh, uh, Pete Townsend, um, Hendrix, Alvin Lee. Basically, you know, uh, what happened was my, my, uh, my older brother took me to, uh, snuck me into Woodstock. It was actually 18 and over. You couldn't, you weren't supposed to be in was accompanied by an adult, which I was, technically was, so, I don't know, I was, uh, I think I was seven years old, and that, that was, a, that was a, a game changer for me, just seeing those performances, uh, wow. Car Carlos Santana, That's pretty it, those performances, it, it was really, it, it was, a, it made a, quite an impression. How, how and then that same York, summer, ask you though, so how come you were in New York, because you were still living in Chicago at that point? Yeah, you said, but yeah, I was. So, your brother said we're going to New York and we're going to Woodstock. Huh? Oh no, I didn't go to the. Con I'm not talking about the movie. Oh, the movie. Yeah, <laughs> the the movie was playing. Uh, you know. All right. This, at this like, at this little arena in the south the south side, man, and it was like, it was just like a concert. It was there was yeah. a there was a stay. You know, it was a. I remember it was. I mean, I was seven years old, so everything looks. But I remember it was not like a regular movie theater. It was there was. Oh really? You know, I think they probably set it up in a small hockey arena, wow. and um, you know we were way in the back, and there was just just tons of smoke, and and I just remember we were back, uh, way back where the camera was, and there was so much smoke in the air you could just see the, you know the the film. The image in the smoke. Yeah, and then the this this. Wow. Giant screen and the, just these 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 sounds, you know what I mean? It it, it just totally blew me away. Uh, so it, it I think it, it that was the 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 beginning. Who were those guys? Pete Towns and Hendrix. You know. Um, when did you start to play? When did you get your first? Um, guitar? Att you know, att attempted it uh, then, didn't get very far. Um, you know, and then uh, didn't really get it together. Till um, at all until years later when we were uh, in San Diego. I was probably in ninth grade. I was 15, right. and um, that's when I when I first sort of managed to make a chord, you know. And uh, I remember there was there was a Fender poster of this uh, angel playing uh, an acoustic guitar, and it had all the notes on it and everything. And she, you know, the the guitar neck was straight up. But I remember actually. It was like that's how I fig figured out my first chord, and then uh, it was like. Thank you. 
Hey, yeah, man. So Aerosmith's version of Train Kept a Rolling is what you're making reference it, to there. It, I remembered the making subtitles. that distinction. Like, I think that's right. <laughs> you know? I was like, I think that... And, and that continues to be uh, a place that I like to go, like learning new stuff. Like, if, even if I had never done this professionally or if it had, if it had kind of, uh, you know only got as far as plugging the thing into that stereo headphone jack. Um, the process of figuring something out has always been, um, you know, a really great sort of uh, oasis from just all the hail things that happen in life, you know, the hail storms and things that happen in life. That is a place I've always been able to go and it's always been, you know, a, a total, it never changes. So, you know, just figuring that out or figuring something else out or figuring out something on my own um, record that I'm working on, it's the same thing. Just being completely concentrating on something is, um, you know, is the best. Um, so, you know, having an instrument and playing it on any level I think is just the best thing you can do, really. Matter of fact, I would advise not trying to do this professionally because <laughs> it just can be miserable. You know? But um, yeah. Well, when you got when you did get more serious about playing and were you know, I mean, did you become because, I mean, there isn't that much time between when you're 15 and when you're already in L.A. joining RAT, pretty much. And it's like four years. So in, over those four years, did you find yourself playing, you know, for six hours a day? Or, you know, like you just became, uh, you know, a guitar junkie. You couldn't stop playing. I'm, you know, like, because you don't, you know, take some work to... A after Out of the Cellar. After you, what? Uh, out of the Cellar, is that... No, yeah. no, 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 I mean, like, but, you know... You said you started to play, and you know, whether it was Aerosmith, Train Kept the Rolling, or whatever it was, those that next period of time, because you said you're in ninth grade, so you're 15, but you're already in LA, you know, when you're 19. So, yeah. So that four year period, were you playing for six hours a day? Like you just got the bug, and you. you were... I was playing, I don't, I probably six hours a day. I mean, it, it was, uh, you know, most of uh, the time after I got back from school, and then probably, you know, was in, in that, yeah, prob probably on and yeah. off, yeah. Because I mean, a lot happened in a relatively short amount of time. You went from someone who was discovering the guitar yeah. to excelling at the guitar. So, um, who were some of the other players that you were there? Players that you well, then the, you songs? know that was kind of you know that I mean? was kind of you know I'm the youngest of six, so you know my my oldest brother. Uh, it was 17 when I was born, so um, I was fortunate to have, um, you know, sort of a musical education uh, to a generation that I really wasn't part of. My, well, by the time I was in high school, we were listening to, uh, you know, UFO, Michael Schenker, uh, Uli Roth. Right, yeah. um, I used to call Uli Roth when I was when I was uh, in high school. This is back when it was just the AT and T cable going from here to the UK, right? And five bucks a minute, and uh, there was this uh, this the first record. Um, there was a phone number on it. it had the country code and everything. O one one eight one da 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 da. And it was this it was the weirdest thing because um, the, I don't know re records. Just were there was something so unapproachable or un, like attainable about a record. You, you know, there was just an address of the record company. You know that the band is you know probably not going to get that. And uh, but there was a phone number. It was like whoa, you know. So um, this uh, <laughs> this crazy uh, this this crazy guy called it a bunch of times and and. Uh, said he was Floyd Rose and they had to talk to Uli John Roth because he had this, this clamping system that he knew he was going to want. 
And they believed him, and they, they gave him Uli John Ross' home phone number. And, uh, <laughs> and then the house that that was happening from, it was like it was these people were squatting at this house, but the phone was still connected. Um, that stopped really quick, right? <laughs> but this number distributed among all those guitar rats and all this kind of thing. It was like it was just like something unreal to have. Like, oh, he's right. You know, this is oh, his phone number. And so we would uh, like, you know, my my friend that played bass in my band. You know, we would have these uh, these kind of these 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 weekend things where I was like worked out the time change and I'm like, you know, you cover Tokyo tapes, they're all fucking rocked out. You know, he's got the leopard coat on and, you know, the hat and everything. I'm like, man, these guys are fucking rockers and, you know, they ain't getting up much earlier than noon. So I woke, worked out the time change. We didn't, you know, we, we had to, for it to be noon in Dusseldorf, we had to wait till 4 a.m., right? So, <laughs> Saturday night would come around, you know, we'd listen to records all night, and then by 4, 4 a.m. we'd start calling. Like, oh, fuck. You know, <laughs> you know, nothing. Well, maybe, uh, maybe he's not up yet, you know, 4.30, try again. One time he fucking is, hello, you know. And, and my friend was like, Say, it's like, just, just, I feel just like I do now. <laughs> Say something, man. Say something. Um, um, I'm Warren, you know. And there's a little echo. I'm Warren. Warren. Hello, hello. Yeah. Uh, my mom gets this phone bill and she's like, do you know someone in Germany? <laughs> uh, it was really cool. I, you know, be in, I don't know, 11th grade and actually talk to, to Uli. And you can, you know, you could tell it was him because of the, because of the singing on some of those songs, you know. It's like, so did he talk to you? Immediately. For huh? a few minutes? He talked to you? Yeah, we you know, I, mean, you know, I talked to him <laughs> probably, for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. He was mercifully cool, you know, answering questions like, what kind of speakers are in your Marshall cabinets? And, you know. <laughs> kind of strings do you use, you know, I and mean, I'm just like, what am I, what do you say, you know, but, uh, um, but, but, uh, yeah, listening to, we were listening to Scorpions with Uli Roth, we were listening to uh, Pat Travers. Yeah, what were, I have to ask you, though, like, what were the tunes, the Scorpion tunes with Uli, um, I don't know if it was uh, Sales of Sharon, you know, which is incredible, but, you know, I'm just curious for my own sake, the, the tunes that you were, where the guitar playing was really knocking you out. It was like, a, the tunes like on Tokyo tapes and like what yeah. were the Scorpion tunes? Yeah. Which tunes? Which tunes did? Yeah. Um, well, like the Sales of Sharon is, is is still it's 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 still just so. You know, um, it's just the it's just so masterful and it, yeah, and it, and, it, and it's like it, I receive it the same with just the same kind of sort of disbelieving awe that I did when I first heard it, yeah. like, you know, um, in, in 10th grade. Um, Catch Your Train, you know, the same thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it was like um, ordinary 70s Strat through, uh, through a, a, a loud, good Plexi Marshall, but it's like it wasn't all, it, it's, it was just, this astonishing playing. It's like it was, um, you know, it was a, it was a pretty, pretty ordinary good stuff, but it, was, it wasn't special, like, right. amp or anything like that. I mean, it was a good amp, but it wasn't, and it's like, it's just so clear, that recording is, the guitar sound is so clear, and, and, and uh, so there's something about it. Um, you know, there's a lot of great ballads on there. Um, we'll Burn the Sky, you know? Yeah. He had a, a thing about his playing that it, it was, it had all the things that make you want to play guitar, but it was also, there was a, um, there was sort of a, a musicality to his, to his shredding that, yeah. that was really um, set him, to me, just kind of set him apart. Yeah, I agree with you. I, to me, the, the touch thing and that sort of um, level of precision, and it wasn't so much blues-based like we were so used to hearing Jeff Beck or Hendrix stuff that came out of blues. Yeah. The European classical thing, 
Yeah. But I've also felt that way about Richie Blackmore. Were you were you a Richie fan? Did you listen? Wasn't to a Richie, Richie fan, you know, of the uh, till later, um, till till much later. Uh, the the um, he just was. I just didn't get Richie till later. The, you know, to later in uh, it, it during that time. You know what I mean? It, it, but but later, as I as I you know, sort of grew to appreciate the riff more, and and respect. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, the the a great a great riff, which might be simple, but to me at at my at that time it was it was just. You know what I mean? I was kind of, I was a, it, it's, I just didn't get Richie till later. Right. But I did really grow to really like and appreciate his work. Yeah, the only reason I thought of him is because, to me, those two guys, Uli and Richie, there was a precision to their playing that was different than the guys, as great as, you know, not to take anything away from Jeff Beck and, and, and Hendrix and Johnny Winter and Clapton and Jimmy Page and all of that, but it was another, sort of uh, execution on the guitar and the way to make a sound on the guitar. Yeah. That was sort of extraordinary, very appealing, and made you want to work on your guitar playing. I think it had everything to do with why, w when you heard, when, afterwards, when you heard Eddie Van Halen and Randy Rhodes, and I mean, they, to me, they were the natural next incarnation of that, especially with Randy, because it was, you could really hear the, uh, class influence of classical music, like on a song like Mr. Crowley and the progressions and the way he played over the mm -hmm. chords and all that stuff. So, you know, um, of course, of course, uh, we were listening. You know, I was listening to uh, to Randy and and uh, Van Halen. Um, did you see? Did you did you see Randy in the clubs in those days in the Quiet Riot? Didn't didn't see him. Didn't see him in the clubs. I but I saw both. Uh, the Blizzard of Oz um, tour. They play the Fox Theater in San Diego, and then um, the next that that uh, Diary of a Madman tour, they played uh, San Diego Sports Arena. So I just was sort of watched. It was right there. Saw it oh, wow. get bigger and bigger and bigger. And, I had and, to be wild. And they were so. Both shows were just exceptional. I mean, it, he just played so so well. Well, Randy was a monster. Yeah, right? I mean, it really, yeah. it really was just like that live it was like you know yeah it give you a lot of I inspiration never... huh very inspiring i mean randy is i'll never forget the first time i heard blizzard you know it was just playing uh and i was just stopped in my tracks i was just like what like this is different like what is this i had to know who the guitar player was yeah because i'd never heard anything like that you know i mean it's extraordinary. So I don't know. You got to LA. Was were there a lot of Randy clones and a lot of competition? You know, in that sense of because what's cool, Warren, is that you you sort of charted your own way. You didn't do that. You know, I was never interested in. Uh, you know, um, um, I I I do sort of work out early on that I, uh, that it, it was probably about the same w coming up with your own things or learning somebody else's perfectly. I mean, I, like I would learn other people's things, but, um, you know, not, maybe not exactly, you know, but, but, uh, but enough, you know, when, when I was starting out. But I, there weren't that many things where, you know, I learned them, you know, note for note exactly like they did it in the whole record. There it wasn't too many of those. Um, it was just kind of a way to learn how to do stuff. And then, um, so, you know, I, I always kind of figured it was better, even if, it, if, even if, it, if you were, weren't playing, you know, as, as, as big a place as you're going to play, playing someone else's music, I always figured it was better to do your own thing on whatever scale you were doing than it was to, to do that. So I was, I was never the least bit interested in the Aussie gig, you know, learning. For one thing, I wouldn't want to have to learn all that, that that Randy stuff, I mean, that stuff, is, a lot of it is really hard, you know. A lot of classically bass, classic, uh, classical guitar based, and, uh, you know. And it's just, it was just so, it was, it was so original, and it was just so iconic. It's like, and I didn't want to, you know, uh, to, you would, to do it respect, you, do, you would have to learn it exact, and, you know, it was right. just something that never, never appealed to me. 
When you were playing them and working on your stuff in those early days, did you feel like you were finding your own sound and your own style? And I don't know if you could play some things, but you know, like, were, were there things that you would work on uh, just as a guitar player in terms of, because you have a very distinct touch and sound along with your vibrato. So I don't know if there's anything you could say about working on that as a guitar player, you know, in a, just a functional way. I, you know, didn't, didn't, I really uh, didn't think, you know, at first, you know, you try to write something, it's like nothing happens. So, you, you know, I thought I couldn't write songs. And then, you know, when I, when I, uh, you got to, you know, when I, when I got to Jake's house, and uh, he's like, well, you know, you don't, you don't write the whole thing. Sometimes you do, he goes, but, but, you know, a lot of times you're just working stuff little by little, you know, and that, so there was a clue. It was like, okay, you don't have to have, you know, the whole thing in one night, you know, so that kind of uh, did the thing, but it was, it was like, uh, just, you know, we needed original songs and, and I just took a shot at it. I just started out with little parts and, and then I'd connect a couple together and then I had, you know, I had a verse and a chorus and then, you know what I mean, a little, and then as people, you know, get involved or add to it or maybe it's something that you come in with this really complete or maybe it's something you've got a couple of parts and then the rest of the band kind of help, help it take the final shape. You know, it's, it's, it's always different that way. Like in Way Cool Junior, everything was, you know, I wrote, you know, everything on that, but on, on uh, other songs it's been, sometimes it's been like, like Round and Round where Robin comes in with the, you know. Right. Well, maybe you could play Way Cool Junior. That's a cool lick. It's very blues. It's kind of, a, that's how I think of it as a very blues bass sort of. Well, it was over, uh, I, I, um, Met Dweezil Zappa early on after Rat, about a year after Rat had been uh, on the road. I came back from that tour and and um, met Dweezil, and he invited me over to the house and and uh, to meet Frank and stuff. And uh, and that was that was an awesome uh, period going over there because uh, he was always very interesting, you know, to be around and always very funny. And um, and one it, uh, on one of those visits, he told he showed us uh, this progression. Maybe not this, but it was like an exercise. And, um, and that worked its way into, into uh, you know, what, what the pre-chorus of the Wakel Jr. <laughs> Play the verse look. Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs>